Good evening and welcome to our program, Hope for Africa. Hope for today, tomorrow, and forever. Once again, hope for today, tomorrow, and forever. Men and women are finding that hope throughout Africa. In fact, let's go to South Sudan. Trans our messages are being translated into Arabic. And uh, 12 souls were baptized in Yom in South Sudan this last Sabbath. I want you to greet our brothers and sisters who are listening and watching these programs in the Arabic language. We praise God that here at New Life we have six translations going forward and one of them is a in Arabic. Let's go from there to Garwanda in Godmawanda in central, uh, in central uh, Kenya uh, by the lake in the, cent in the Kenyan Lake Conference uh, out in the marketplace. You know, I'm amazed at how many, place, how many people in the marketplace are hearing the word of God. We give the appeal and there in the marketplace they find not simply bread but they find the bread of life in Jesus Christ. Let's go now to another quite amazing site in some things that are happening with drunkards. Now, here in Eldoret, there's 128 former drunkards that are camped there. Now, the lady that you see with her back to us is Sister Salome. Sister Salome has dedicated her life to working with drunkards. Every day she works with them. She has a camp. They come out of the city. They get good food. They get counseling. And many of them accept Christ. And praise God, 46 of them were baptized last Sabbath. Amen. What do you say, church? Amen. Sister Salome, if you are watching tonight, I want you to know that we affirm your ministry and we will be praying for you. In the Magori Central Seventh-day Adventist Church in the West Kenya Union, the uh, church is packed. Uh, people are following intently and in making decisions for Jesus. You know, these messages are going all over the world. They're, and Kenyans are all over the world. Did you know that? There's Kenyans all over the world. We got a message from a Kenyan who's, in, who's having treatments in India in a hospital there. You know, when Kenyans travel around the world, they talk about hope for Africa. Many of them are watching via internet or YouTube. This particular Kenyan brother is in Africa for treatment. And he said, you know, God must have sent me here for more than treatment. He began witnessing to his doctor. He began witnessing to the hospital staff. And they are watching these programs from India. We also got a message today from Dubai, where Kenyans are watching there. Every place in the world where Kenyans are, they are turning to these messages. Our title tonight, the message tonight, is called The Fatal Attraction of the Cults. Let's pray. And wherever you are, I'm praying tonight that the Spirit of God is going to touch your heart. I'm praying tonight that if you've been hesitating in a decision, you'll make one tonight. Because the truth of the matter is, the greatest cult in the history of the world is soon to come. And that's under the Antichrist, under the mark of the beast. And when that cult comes, millions are going to be deceived. But the principles that I'm going to give you tonight on why cults are attracting people today those principles you're going to be able to apply to identify the Antichrist, the beast power, and the greatest cult that ever came. We are going to help you tonight identify cults that are present in Africa and around the world, but we're going to help you to identify the great cult at the end. So let's pray. Father in heaven, 
Thank you that Jesus is our Savior. Thank you that the Word of God is our guide. Thank you that the law of God is our foundation. Thank you that the coming of Christ is our hope. And thank you that you've given us the power of choice. So tonight as we study cults, I pray that you'd enable us to have eyes that are wide open, ears attentive to your word, and hearts receptive to it. In Christ's name, amen. The nation of Kenya was shocked. The news began to filter in about a place called Shakahola, where a cult had met under Pastor McKinsey. And the news began to filter in, first little at first, that a group of his followers were starving themselves, thinking that if they starved themselves to death, they could meet God. As the authorities began to examine that camp, and as some leaders were arrested, they began to exhume, exhume bodies, dig up bodies. First they found 12, then 20, then 50, and the latest count is 405 bodies. Why did these Kenyans follow this cult leader? And why do people throughout Tanzania, Rwanda, Uganda, why do people throughout Inter and South America and Asia follow cult leaders? Why do people in the United States why did they follow people like Jim Jones down to the jungles of Guyana where a thousand of them took poison and died? Why did they do that? Why did people follow David Koresh to Waco in Texas in America and die in fiery flames? What, what led them to do that? Cults are nothing new. Let me take you back to the first century and even before that down through the centuries, Satan has attempted to deceive human beings by exalting man above God. And here in ancient Egypt, the pharaohs were exalted above God. In Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar was exalted above God. In ancient Rome, imperial Rome, you have the imperial cult of Rome where a worship of a few select emperors were worshipped as God. You remember that John was the last of the living apostles. And John lived at the days of Domitian. Domitian was the only living emperor to declare himself God. I'll show you a fascinating coin discovered by the archaeologist. On one side of this coin is Domitian's, is Domitian's picture. On the other side of the coin is his son made God by Domitian. So Domitian claimed he was God, and he claimed that if his followers did not worship him, that they were not worshiping God and would be executed. We learn something from cults down through the centuries, as well as modern cults. The Apostle John challenged that cult worship, challenged emperor worship, and he was exiled by Domitian on the island of Patmos. And it was there God gave him the book of Revelation. And John wrote in Revelation, when the seventh angel of the seventh trumpet sounded, John writes in Revelation 11, verse 15, then the seventh angel sounded, and there, was, there were loud voices from heaven saying, the kingdom of this world became the kingdoms of our Lord and of Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Domitian said, I am the Lord, and I'll establish Pax Romana, that is peace on earth. John said, there is one Lord, and that is Jesus Christ our Lord. And only peace will come when Jesus comes, and the King of kings returns, and his kingdom will be forever. I want to give you tonight ways you can identify a cult. John helps us there. There is only one Lord, and he's Jesus Christ. 
No human being or his word can take the place of the word of God. There are only false gods, but there's only one true God. There are many false Christs, but there's only one true Christ. Now, cult watchers indicate that there are 5,000 cults in our world right now. 5,000 cults. Millions of people are being taken in by these cults. Now, a survey of 700 different psychologists revealed that 26% of the people they counseled said they were former cult members. The reason cults are growing is because people are seeking. People are seeking something beyond themselves. Most people recognize that this world is in deep trouble. Most people recognize that something great and decisive is about to happen. Most people recognize that if life in this earth is all there is, if death is a long night without a morning, if the grave is a dark hole in the ground and there's no entry from the grave, that there's no purpose. So people go seeking, they go looking. They go looking for leadership. They go looking for somebody who has authority, somebody who's certain, somebody who's definite. But the problem is this. The cult followers are looking for answers in all the wrong places. They're looking for answers where there are not answers, and they're opening their minds to be deceived by Satan. If you understand why people accept counterfeits, it's because they do not know how to distinguish truth from error. And tonight, we're going to look at five biblical tests that distinguish the genuine from the counterfeit. Five tests. Five identifying characteristics of a cult. You can help your children not be deceived by cults. You can help a husband, a wife, a brother or sister not be deceived by cults. You can help yourself when the great antichrist cult comes because everything that's happening now in those 5,000 cults, Satan is practicing. Satan is seeing how he can deceive people and he's learning how people are deceived so that when he palms off the greatest deception of the Antichrist, he can deceive millions. So here are five ways to identify a cult. Number one, cults have a single powerful leader who becomes the cult's messiah. That's what happened in Shakahola. That's what happened with this Pastor McIntosh, uh, Pastor McKenzie. He became the cult's messiah. That's what happened with David Koresh in Waco. He became the cult's messiah. That's what happened with Jim Jones. He became the cult's messiah. That's what happened in Japan with Shakahoro Ashura. He became the cult's messiah. That's what happened in Uganda with Joseph Kabitri. So every cult has this idea where the human cult messiah takes the place uh, of God. One of the devil's greatest deceptions is getting us to look to human beings for our salvation rather than getting us to be anchored in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Now somebody says, but wait a minute, these people were sincere. Isn't sincerity enough? You can be sincere, but if you are following error, you can be lost just as well as not being lost. Sincerity is not enough. Look what the Bible says. Proverbs chapter, 20, chapter 16, verse 25. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end is the way of death. Repeat that text with me, please. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of what? Death. Does that person think they're doing the right thing? Do they believe they're doing it the right thing? Are they sincere? Do you think those people that went out to Shakahola, do you think they thought they were doing the right thing? Do you think they went out there thinking, well, oh, we're deceived, you know, but we're going to go there anyway. Do you think that was what they thought? Not at all. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the, 
but in the end it's the way of death. What is the way that seems right to a man? It's your own way. It's any way that's contrary to the Bible. You may think Sunday keeping is right, but there's a way that seems right that leads to death. You see, you may think it's right to smoke, drink, take drug, no problem. There's a way that seems right that leads to death. You may think living with somebody else that's not your wife is okay. Oh, that's okay. There is a way that what? Seems right. Any way that is contrary to the Bible may seem right to us. Cult leaders prey on their word rather than God's word. Anytime we transfer our loyalty to any religious leader and exalt that leader in the place of God, we are on very, very dangerous ground. That leader may be your priest. That leader may be, be your imam. That leader may be your pastor. Any time we say, you know, a lot of times people come to my meetings and they say, oh, Pastor Mark, you preach from the Bible that the Sabbath was the seventh day of the week, but my pastor says this. My priest says this. If you put your religious confidence in your religious leader, you are preparing to accept the great deception at the end when the Antichrist, the greatest cult, comes. There is only one safety, and our safety is placing our loyalty in Jesus Christ. You know, when David Koresh took those people to Waco, there was a young man that escaped two weeks before the fiery flames. I interviewed that young man. And I said to that young man, share with me, what brought you to Waco? Why did you go to Waco? And what made you leave? He said, David Koresh was so convincing. He would sit down and we would study the Bible for eight hours together, but there could be no discussion. It was his word and that's all. And he said, why I left is this. When David Koresh said, I am the Lamb of God in the book of Revelation. This man said, that's enough for me. I have been deceived. I have been, uh, 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 and he said, I have to get out of here. And so he left. My friends, millions are going to fall for the Antichrist in the future. Why? Because they take the word of man rather than the teachings of Christ. And they substitute Christ. Now notice what it says in the book of Thessalonians. Notice how the Bible tells us that the Antichrist is going to grow. It says, let no man deceive you. Let no man do what, everybody? Let nobody do what? I don't want to be deceived, do you? Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, that's the coming of Christ, will not come unless there's a falling away first. A falling away from what? A falling away from total faith in Jesus, a falling away from Bible truth, a falling away, a listening to man's teachings rather than Jesus' teachings. That falling away is going to come, that apostasy. And that the man of sin is revealed. How do you define sin in the Bible? 1 John 3 verse 4, it says this. It says, sin is the transgression of God's law. So the man of sin has changed God's law. It says the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. It goes on to say, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So the final antichrist, and this is what Satan is practicing now, Satan is practicing 
by raising up 5,000 cults, and more of these cults are going to grow, and he's getting people to put their dependence in man. And these cults have a Messiah-like leader. Why? Because when the world is in its most major crisis at the time of the end, when there's famine and earthquake and fire and flood, when there's war and conflict, and when a powerful world leader arises saying that they're going to leave they're going to unite church and state and the world will be at peace you see the